background first. Uh, we've been a state in the union for 163 years. We have been arguing about water each and every year since. I predict with an absolute certainty we will continue to argue about water for as long as we are a society. And that is important because people get bored with all the arguments. And my general impression as a recovering politician is people can only remember so much about complicated subjects. So if they were around 30 years ago, they remember they were fighting about a peripheral canal. Well, if that's what you remember then, like Rick Frank was 12 years old at the time, and he was involved, involved in the battle against uh, the peripheral canal. Well, you still fight that fight today, because that's how you understand it. You don't turn to people like me who talk about, you know, really pulsing water flows. I mean, sure, a bunch of academics and students pulsing a water flow is a big deal. It might even be important, very important. But for people, what do people know about that? They know about just the general terms. So keep in mind that these fights always require general terms, which is another way of saying, it. and as you pursue your academic career, don't forget to speak in simple English if you wish anyone to understand you and if you wish your ideas to have an impact. Okay. Now, the focus on water in California for a long time, but certainly in the last 60, 70 years, has been on the Sacramento, San Martin, Bay Delta region, and in particular what we call the Delta. And that's not an unfair characterization, because roughly the, the, the water that flows off all the watersheds in California, about 40% typically would, would have gone through the Delta, to the Bay, to the ocean. But of all the water we consume in California, only 15% is exported from the Delta state water. Now, the water that is exported from the Delta, only about 15% of the exported water goes across the Tehachapi's to the evil forces of the, the octopus, Southern California, the swimming pools of uh, Utopia, the surfboarding regimes of uh, all. The lion's share goes to Valley Agriculture between uh, uh, Stockton and and Bakersfield, and a surprisingly large amount goes to the Bay Area. But of course, the water politics are regional politics. They've always been regional politics. <coughs> Those of us who live in Northern California, the mayor of Sacramento, what else could I be? We know who is good. We know who is right. We know who is perfect. We know who is blameless. We know who should not pay for anything. It's us. And who is left? Well, you! All of you! Uh, but the reality of the fact, as you will hear many times, if you've heard this from the instructors, all of us who live in Northern California and use water from the watershed of the Delta, from you know, the mountains here in Nevada, down near Fresno, below Fresno, all the way up to the border, we use twice as much water every year as is exported from the Delta. And you might ask yourself the question, why if the Delta didn't take part of water, you know, only 15% of the total water used every year, and if Northerners are bigger consumers of water, and a lot of us prevent water that used to reach the Delta from reaching, why do we argue about this as a more south pattern? Well, we're used to it. And if you don't explore the issue, you will continue to think that is the matter. Um, Today's Delta, as all of you know, is radically different from the past. There are no longer vast swatches of, uh, of wetlands or marshes or riparian habitats. There are not uh, riverine floodplains. There are not massive independent floodplains. Because society, our society, favors agriculture and urban development over nature. That is the history of it. By the way, that is, as best I can tell, the history of virtually every society on earth that I've examined. Go, go read Jared Diamond again, and you'll be all luminous that comes from that. Uh, the fish species have been suffering in the Delta for as long as we have guesses, hunches, or, or hopes and fears about fish species. 
And if human activity has affected all of that, our alteration of the physical configuration of the Delta is perhaps the most dramatic. Statutory Delta, declared by the legislature in the 1950s, has about 737 acres of land within it. Not giant, but it's not, you know, it's not big. Uh, the Susun Marsh, largely undeveloped area because duck club guys are out there with shotguns and you can't do much else than, you know, flood it for ducks and, and let it get floated on its own. Uh, the Susun Marsh has yeah, 100,000 acres on top of that. We have lost, as you know, in California, over 95% of all the wetlands in the state. We have lost over 95% of the wetlands, the habitat within the statutory area. It's been replaced by people and agriculture and business and a little bit of industry. And urban growth is all of the edges, from West Sacramento to Sacramento to Stockton to the little towns of Contra Costa County. Only Solano is relatively free because of the Susun Marsh and, and military bases that, that tend to be our greatest protector of urban territory uh, these days, albeit unintentional. Uh, we've also given, well, those of us who live in the watershed up north, we have given presence to the Delta. We have presented them with our urban realm. We have presented them and continue to present them with our agriculture. We have presented to them our array of mercury that still lists and sits in the water and mercury that is yet to come. Uh, we are the proud contributor to a bunch of presents to the Delta <coughs> that caused many of the problems with this today. And of course, behind all of the arguments and the issues, one of the things you want to remember is an old slogan. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah, is one people we'll remember. It's going down. Uh, when we started to regulate seriously on pollution in America, the engineers finally developed the slogan, the solution to pollution is pollution. Uh, now that's, you know, like all these academics here, they laugh that out of the room. But they, you know, most people say, oh, okay, that sounds pretty interesting. The problem, of course, is our watershed use of water affects both the quality of the water that eventually reaches the Delta and the quantity of that water. Which means that, guess what? The real argument that's going on is you can't take water out of the delta because, well, gosh, that might mean we might get stuck with a bill for our own pollution, and we can avoid that for 60 or 70 or 100 years if you just stop taking the water because then our pollution is more polluted. Sacramento Regional Sanitation Plant, on which I sat as a very young city council member a long time ago, decided in the late 1960s during planning stages not to do tertiary drinking. So we have this big, really, I mean, it's a sock of a plant. It's, it, it is the contributor of 90% of the ammonia that reaches the Delta. Ooh, wow. And a bunch of scientists, including people sitting in this room, have concluded that the interruption of the food chain, you have the food that fish feed on by ammonia, ammonium, has in fact contributed. And the, uh, the uh, government agencies from Yolo, uh, from West Sacramento, and parts of Yolo to Sacramento County, city to the county itself, are facing, they claim, a devastating bill of $2 billion. In an earlier life, <coughs> something called Dell Division, Mr. Frank and I were uh, colleagues in uh, and both live in urban Sacramento, and you would think might lead to the defense of our brethren who did not, and neighbors who did not want to pay massive amounts of money for tertiary treatment. And instead, we had the absolutely delightful pleasure of writing one of the stiffest letters to them, explaining that their position is unacceptable to argue that our pollution is acceptable, downstream users should clean it up on their own particularly coming from a society, Sacramento, the old local property owners, who, who, led, who forced the courts of California in the 1800s to completely close down hydraulic mining in California because of the damage to downstream waters. So, the Deltas, <laughs> it's there, it's dramatically affected, and the problems are immense. And ironically, after all this effort, all the changes in, uh, in terms and conditions. We, we built levees, we made narrow 
rivers, we channelized the rivers so the water could flow faster. We converted the habitat land into whatever we want to do with it, and all of a sudden, uh, we're still living in a flood prone area. Now, so you would think, I mean, you know, this is, they're great. There must be engineers in this room, right? What are one or two engineers in this room? No. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen, if you haven't read any of the terrific book by David McCullough, <coughs> The Path Between Two Seas, the story of the building of, of the Panama Canal, I would commend it to your atten in, uh, attention. It and the story of the Suez Canal are kind of classic representations of the famous doctrine that uh, engineers can shape the earth and change the world and all of that. But of course, we can't avoid flood risk in a flood-prone area of the state. And you might ask yourself, well, who cares about that? I mean, all the San Francisco runs up an earthquake fault. What the hell are you talking about? I said, well, that's going to drop into the ocean. The question is, why am I under what terms and conditions? I mean, these things, you know, you're all, you're all uh, students of uh, uh, science and ecology. You know these things. But it's as if the flood risk is somehow separated from all the other factors. And flood risk, at least in my opinion, is not. And then pesky nature, other nature, is screwing over our good intentions. <laughs> uh, God damn climate change. Can you, you believe it? Here we've got this terrible problem, but what do you mean if you have a plan to fix the problem? What are they doing? Well, there's a lot of changing. Increasing. Gosh, get what? Guess what? These these doomsayers at UC Davis, the scientists at UC Davis, uh, Jeff Mounts, who no, no longer he's, he's retired, but Dr. Doom Mount used to give the great speech with a giant smile. It would say, oh, yes, we're all doomed, uh, and that's just the way it is, we're in love with it. And in fact, we are the environment, the water system upon which we rely, the societies that we have built are fundamentally affected by all these things, including that creeping little puritan called sea level rise, which if you if you believe now conservative estimates of a potential five foot rise by the year 2100, the inundated territory in the statutory delta is as much as 250,000 acres. We, uh, in television, we've got a great chart from the, from the USGS on that, you know, outline the whole thing. And of course, the other part that's nice is government. The government does a lot of things that people don't pay any attention to it. Uh, so as you as you know, in California, uh, everybody owns all the water. Uh, and uh, and your use is, is granted by uh, canon law and the Constitution. But that's a pesky little stuff of public interest that goes on, including what happens to periodically flooded land. And it, it relates back to the whole notion that uh, navigable waters belong to everyone, they belong to any person. And the you know, obscure state boards and the of state lands will all of a sudden be sending out these delicious letters to property and say, and, and Mr. Franklin, who's in the Attorney General's office, would have been drafting those letters. And he would have said, well, far more politely than I will, what the milk is, hi. Your water, your property is now subject to inundation to the level of XXX. This is to advise you that long sign is signed standing in California law with antecedents in the British common law and going back to the Justinian Code, means you no longer own that property. And oh, by the way, nobody has to buy it if you have simply lost it. Because that's what happens when rivers change their course to the next Now you say, what is this nature routine? It's been quite irritating. But it's important because the delta remains a really vital interesting uh, and powerfully uh, uh, important ecosystem. Largest uh, estuary on the Western Hemisphere, uh, uh, our side of the earth. Pacific flyway for birds, and a mixture of a whole lot of stuff. Um, restoration of the Delta ecosystem is, at least in my judgment, a moral imperative. But more than that, it is a legal requirement of major water projects for the future. 
and that intersection of status is a large part of what we're arguing about. Um, <clears throat> in, in politics, we tend to say that the only thing we want to argue about is big canals on forum against them, uh, and uh, you're taking my water for the loss of all the And, that, and that's, that really is what most people are doing. Uh, but the reality is we've been exporting water through and out of the Delta for almost 60 years. 60 years. Now, people don't like that. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people take it. But it's been going on for 60 years. The chance of it stopping anytime soon seems to be remote. The real question is how much will When, where, why, for what purpose? And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, our water supply in California comes 97% from precipitation. We have records going back to 1880 or 1885 on precipitation records in California. Do a trend line, guess what? It hasn't dramatically changed up or down. A little change you know, since 1880. Now, I understand you all are in the larger years in the last couple hundred years, but for most people, 1885 is ancient history, roughly equivalent to the Roman Empire of Greece, I guess. Uh, but it's pretty dramatic because what it suggests to you is that what's really going on is an ample supply in 1850 and 1870 and 1880 and 1920 and arguably up to about 1970 or uh, 1980. An ample supply was reasonably easy to contemplate, identify, and move around if you had to move it if you didn't have a lot of people. In 1850 when we became a state, there were, as best we know, 100,000 native Californians, uh, 300,000 that had been lost on acid and illness and so on, and then 300,000 European uh, interlopers. Well, that had to be mostly up north, we got a lot of water. But as populations grow, 38 million people today, an economy of $2 billion, it ought not to surprise everyone that there's a certain amount of tension going on because people are used to patterns of behavior. Uh, so what, what all this uh, comes down to is that uh, the growing demand for water, even when moderated by reductions in per capita use, the overall growing demand for water is bumping up against a static supply. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the future in California, with the big delta tunnel, without a big delta tunnel. The future of California is going to be water efficiencies, water conservation, use, reuse, 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 and reuse again of water. And it's going to cost more money. And it doesn't matter whether you build these big things or not, you face those dilemmas. Uh, uh, politics and government in the water area lurches uh, into making decisions once every 50 or 70 years, and the voters seem to follow that pattern too. Um, we closed down hydraulic mining, we built levees in the Delta, we, <laughs> we sucked the federal government into joining our efforts to protect the flood from Central Valley, <laughs> largely at their expense. Boy, is that a story. I mean, uh, we, we did the, the all shucks routine, it was just it was terrific, and we've been milking the federal cow ever since on that. And then environmental problems started to happen, the environmental group, uh, movement happened, and Californians decided, hey, we like the environment, let's protect the environment. And all of a sudden, we're no longer protecting a water supply system just so you and I can drink it or swim in it or have a farm. We're protecting it through a whole lot of other things. Uh, peripheral canal with, I'm sorry, federal water project authorized by the voters narrowly in the middle of the Great Depression. Forget our or recession. That was a serious 25% unemployment. It went on for a long time. It took 10, 12 years to work it out and World War II to move a lot of the weight labor force out of unemployment into the military. Uh, the past narrow. The interesting thing, of course, is that uh, Northern California was then in support of moving water to the valley in, uh, in the 
Depression. Southern California wasn't. By 1950s, we started to talk about what became the state water project. And in 1960, the voters again narrowed past the state water project. You know, that's, that's interconnected <coughs> the facilities of Oroville down through the two big pipes that go through the central valley that you see when you drive uh, down and around I-5. By 1960, though, we were talking about the next stage, which was moving water from the Delta. Now, we did want moving water from the Delta, but moving serious water from the Delta. So it's a more. The federal project started to move water from the Delta in the mid-1950s. The state project came in, I think it went online in 1967, was my recollection. And we began moving water over there, water there. Uh, governor Brown, the early young Governor Brown, the, uh, the Governor Brown of, uh, of the Chevrolet car and the mattress on the floor in his apartment, and you can find him at, at, at uh, David's Brass Rail uh, every evening during the legislative scene. Honestly, God, that's true. So, stories are not true, but that's a true story. Uh, uh, marriage has seriously hobbled his socialization, although it's good, I think, personally. Jerry Brown said, let's do a peripheral canal. Now, the idea has been kicking around for decades. I mean, nothing to do about the idea. And the voters of California narrowly approved that. Authorizing the shipping of water from the Delta south to the Mexican border and the authorized, beginning precise construction of facilities and dams and all that kind of stuff to do so. And that legal authority, backed up by statute, is what this fight has been founded upon ever since. In 1982, after a bitter political battle, the peripheral canal was passed by the legislature, again, narrowly in the legislature, and an interesting coalition. All us uh, northerners, our allies, the famous environmental farmers of the South Central Valley, Mr. Boswell and Mr. Salyer, who objected to the peripheral canal also had a constitutional amendment to prohibit taking water from the North Coast rivers to move down, which was part of the original plan. And think about that, prohibit taking North Coast water. And so the voters in California are pretty significant. 54% of the voters said no. We, they referendum the law in the field. And that rock did everybody back on their heels. They knew these fights were ugly, but they seemed to work until 1982. Ever since then, people have been trying to figure out what's going around. So, Rick and I were on a group called Television, and appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger, by the way, and uh, they said, uh, give, us a, give us a plan for the Delta, sustainable management of the Delta. So we did. spent two years doing that same kind of thing. The legislature, to our absolute astonishment, did a good part of it. I mean, I just, I, I, I would go, I don't tell you Rick will. I predicted our chance of success in the legislature was less than 10%. I was the most pessimistic. I mean, I didn't know that. Why would this happen? To my absolute astonishment, they passed a package of bills that came pretty close to what we recommended. First of all, state policy now is state policy, nothing else. It's statute. State policy is the co-equal goals. Okay, more water, a more reliable water system for California and a protected, restored Delta ecosystem. <coughs> Those are the co equal ones. They shall be done in a way that is sensitive to the unique features of the Delta. You know, where the real people live. It's not just a place where you have a, a restoration area or a water supply system. Then the second thing they put into the law is a policy, I'm going to read it to you. The policy of the state of California is to reduce reliance on the Delta and meeting California's future water supply needs through a statewide strategy of investing in improved regional supplies, conservation, and water <coughs> use efficiency. Then language becomes that everybody has to do it. Now, normal people would look at the law and say, well, you know, I read the law. Okay, the law's the law, that's it. But I'm like, this is, this is California, this is America. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't matter whether laws are passed, it matters whether people like the laws that are passed. I am a, a, a big fan of the conservative academic, now deceased, uh, James Q. Wilson, for those of you who actually read anything in Britain, he died last year. And he wrote a delicious book, it's a little hard joint, but it's a delicious book called Bureaucracy, What They Do and Why They Do. 
and is the contrast of American public decision making to European Parliament decision. I just want to read you this one short period. Policy making in the United States is more like a bar room brawl. Anyone can join in. Combatants fight all comers and sometimes change sides. No referee is in charge, and the fight lasts not for a fixed number of rounds, but indefinitely or until everyone drops from exhaustion. To repeat former Secretary of George Schultz's remark, it's never over. That is so spot on in public policy in this country. I cannot tell you how right it is. I just can't tell you how right it is. And it's that conflict of uh, uh, how we make decisions and what we're willing to receive that really this business is all about. OK, so I got that off my chest. Now, even now, I'm going to talk to you about all the stuff that you wanted to talk about. And the first place, which is, what's this thing called they build the conservation plan, and what's going to happen, right? So you're, I mean, these are mostly group Water types. Yes. Yeah, OK. Well, for the two of you who have not heard this before, uh, in 2006, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger started up the new canal tunnel thing all over again, uh, a hiatus that had lasted since the first of the canal in 1982. Uh, other governors have taken a little whack at it, but not seriously. Arnold started up the process uh, to break holes of indignation. Uh, and the, uh, the process uh, eventually now has been going on almost seven years. They have spent a minimum of $150 million Money. By the way, it is money from the water exporter communities, the water districts, mostly from the Central Valley and Southern California, but not exclusively. The water districts are paying the cost, or the lion's share of the cost of the project. Another $100 million will be needed to complete the process. Now, we're doing our little Bell's plan stewardship council, this new agency that got created, and we're kind of embarrassed because the plan's 500 pages long, it's hell our environmental impact report like 1,800 pages long, we get embarrassed for that. Well, gee, the fatal conservation plan, we don't know how big it's going to be, but right now it looks like the plan's 5,000 pages, the EIR is going to be at least 17,000 pages. By the way, much of this has been posted on the website for a good long time. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. But the point on this issue is um, still a basic question. Is a big new Delta water export facility going to be built anytime soon? Starting point. Nothing in public policy in America, whether it's water world, health care, criminal justice, happens fast. Just understand that. That's a starting point. Nothing happens fast. But PDCP has been plugging along. All of this work is backed by impressive science. I didn't say it was accurate science. I didn't say you'd agree with their conclusions. But the process is pretty impressive. And it is backed by a lot of study and research, including economic studies that are going on. Now, remember what has to happen on the project. America is a, pro is a country where everybody gets to demand that any idea they have be studied before any notion be approved by government. And you know that's kind of, I, know, I know that's not the law, but that's kind of the view of, of Americans. Uh, so the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is studying all kinds of ideas, but basically they'll come up sometime. Draft probably this year, uh, maybe four, five, six months from now. Uh, finished product, meaning ready for circulation for additional comments, early 2014. And you know that's a lot. That's fast moving. They've got to complete that process so they actually have a proposal. By the way, this is a proposal of federal and state agencies, water agencies and environmental agencies. And they will eventually require a whole bunch of clearance of, I mean, did you wash your hands every 30 minutes during the hearing, yes or no? If you didn't, we're going to make you do it all over again. I mean, it's exhausting. They have to get take permits on the endangered species of the federal government. They have to clear CEQA requirements. They have to clear new statutory requirements imposing duties of study and research and consideration imposed by the famous 19, uh, 2009 statute. Even to their absolute horror, they might have to actually appear in front of us, the poor little Delta Stewardship Council, because we have a piece of the action because people who don't, who don't like a decision that this satisfies the requirements of the law. Can it be a look at us? Huh. 
wow, that's kind of interesting. Uh, it doesn't make us high on the list of favorite characters. You know, where God knows they have enough stopping points in this process. But they got to do all that, get some kind of clearance. That's before they can even buy property or right of way or construction. It's before they can, you know, they're still suing to go on property in the Delta to do soil samples to see whether this is adjustable or not. I mean, it's, it's then in addition, if they identify property, whether it's for water facilities or environmental purposes, they then have to go out and negotiate a price. Um, you know, you, any of you been involved in condemnation actions? Public acquired property, you know, freeway goes somewhere, they're gonna tear down houses, you gotta buy the property, fair market value required, evil judges impose it, and, and you know, everybody has different values. A uh, great story reported by the Vallejo newspaper a couple of years ago. In Skaggs Island on the way to Marin County on Black Point Cut, which many of you have passed, has all these giant old World War II period towers out there because it was a communication center during World War II. It got closed down 10 years ago. Feds decide, oh hell, it's 3,000 acres of land north into the North Bay, right? So the water is right, you know, right out there, kind of slate, saline water. What do you do with it? Well, the, the, the military owned 2,000 of the 3,000 acres. And so they say, well, let's make a restoration. And so they say, well, let's get the other 1,000 1, acres from the, the farmer. And the farmer uh, is, is farming, well, he's worth the hay, not exactly your highest quality crop as you'd expect, pretty saline water or other stuff. And he refuses to sell it. Now, that's not a low income. But the Vallejo newspaper goes to him and he said, well, you just turned down an offer for $6,000 an acre for hay. And he says, the quote that best describes condemnation, he says, look, if I use the Hope Dino for a paperweight, it's still the Hope Dino. <laughs> and you think about that, and that is exactly how condemnation actually I mean, just, it, it just, it's, a, it's a terrific thing. Now, once they get through all of that stuff, then they got to start construction, which in answer to the original question, which sounded pretty simple, but isn't. All the insiders say, after the lawsuits too, from today, the earliest you'll you move water through any new tunnel of any size is somewhere between 10 and 15 years. America's demand fast action, also demand complete participation and no controversy, and the end result is, is, is this. So, how big is the facility going to be? Well, I mean, hell, I don't know how big the facility is going to be, but it's get, been getting smaller. But the old peripheral canal, which was the last time we had what passed for a credible study, was a surface ditch, 43 miles long, had a capacity, a volume of water running through it, if I remember correctly, 21,800 cubic feet a second. Damn big. What, twice as big as this? I don't know. Rick, what was it? I mean, it's about like that. I mean, big. The Bay Delta Conservation Plan that Arnold struck was also going to be a ditch. It's there now for like a tunnel. Uh, and it, but it dropped the, the figure of capacity down to 18,000 cubic feet a second. Uh, in July of last year, Governor Brown and Ken Salazar had a really delicious press conference in Sacramento about baby BDCP. They dropped the capacity down to 9,000 cubic feet per second. Now, stipulate, if you don't like the tunnel, it could be the tiniest, teeniest toy tunnel in the world, you won't like it. And the Delta area legislators have been universally in opposition to big tunnels, medium-sized tunnels, small tunnels, any time they're opposed to the current situation. Yeah. Uh, but the trend line is down. The number of, uh, of intakes is three, not five, as it started in the Schwarzenegger plan. Now, leaving behind a 9,000 cubic feet capacity tunnel or tunnels, there's a reason to build two underground, uh, you still have a humongous sized thing. These are not, I mean, when I say teeny tiny pipe, I don't mean, I mean, this size, this room size, is probably smaller than a teeny tiny one. Because what you're trying to do is you build the tunnel to make the fastest transfer of water possible at given periods of time. Uh, now, what's going to actually happen on the, on the, on the 
I don't have any idea how big the facility is going to be. It would not surprise me to see further adjustments in the size. A lot of it has to do with the federal environmental agencies and whether they believe that the size of the tunnel tied to the question of the amount of water that will be taken from the delta either helps or doesn't help fish species. And we just won't know the answer to that. But the tendency has been going down. Now, is it going to, which is the next point, is it going to import more water, less water, or the same amount of water? The answer is yes, we don't. <laughs> because theoretically, you know, if you have a pipe that's 9,000 cubic feet per second, the answer is, well, if you ran that continuously 24 hours a day, you would pump the delta drop. I'm a politician. I'm in to overstate my guy. <laughs> but that is a relatively clear overstatement. Uh, we've been exporting water since the 1950s. Uh, I think we're gonna, uh, they're, going, they're going to continue. But here's a really important and very intriguing question. Uh, last year, the rumor began to float around that the water contractors were no longer asking for legal guarantees on the amount of water that would be taken from the Delta. Now, I can't tell you how odd that sounds to somebody in the water world. Because guarantees, whether the guarantees on water delivery or the number of salmon that pass a certain point at March 31st of each year, or I mean, Americans are, we may be risk takers. Well, we want legal guarantees of protection. I, I mean, that's just the way we are as a people. So, you know, I dismissed the rumors for a long while, and notables, like, you know, like the guys in this room, began saying, gee, I hear it's actually. Well, to my absolute astonishment, when the governor and, and Secretary Salazar held a press conference, the staff packet included the description that, uh, as, as one really smart and smart LED person said, we are embracing scientific uncertainty. And you know, that's what scientists tell us all the time. You know, scientists say, you can't, we say, how do we protect fish? And Jay says, well, you gotta do a lot of things, but we can't guarantee the fish will actually get better. Well, you can't guarantee the fish will get better. You're a, you're a scientist. You're, you're, you're acknowledged to be the big cheeses in the profession. And, and you know, recently, Oh, if we spend a bazillion dollars and we and we do all this kind of stuff, well, we must get something good for it. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the old uh, movie about uh, hell in the uh, in the atmosphere. What, 2011, 12. You know, what's going to happen? Oh, something wonderful. Well, that's what they actually said. I mean, I am just dumbfounded to this minute. Uh, that the water contractors seem sort of uh, willing to, to contemplate what is in fact a truth so fundamental that Americans tell them is prefer to ignore. The more we guarantee anything, right, whether it is money for education, money for health care, lower taxes, water for people, water for farms, water for the environment, the more you guarantee without referencing the available supply, the more problems you're going to have. And uh, all I can say is, in, in thinking about Jerry Brown, who was, you know, he, I, I was a new mayor when, uh, when he left office, and he'd been around all my life, and he's still one of the most interesting political figures I've ever met. I think he may be the only Californian big statewide policymaker who actually understands that what we're trying to do is interject some honest discussion into this. Now, I know he throws in all the adjectives and he's going to give his father's legacy and all that stuff, but we'll talk about that later. Um, pay attention to that issue. If you're concerned about this, pay attention to what happens in large, in large if in fact they do not guarantee expectations. Now, lawyers like Rick Frank spent his years either guaranteeing or threatening to guarantee or threatening to disrupt water contracts, and you know, the, the sacred thing called water rights, which is statutory in a system, it's not a constitutional system. And it's built on the notion if people want something and they ask for something, you say yes to it, even if you've written deep down in the bowels of the contract, if the water isn't available for nature, you can't get it. 
nobody believes that, or they certainly don't act like that. So if, if this is an honest discussion, it is in public policy terms, I don't know about environmental terms, it is in public policy terms revolutionary. Because it starts to recognize the apparent uncertainty of man trying to control nature and base human expectations on an artificial premise of the game. It also will make environmentalists, interestingly enough, uneasy. Because environmentalists learn the lessons. And if, well, if they're asking for guaranteed water, I want 90,000 salmon smelt this time, this river, and this creek. All the scientists, you know, they sit around the room and say, you know how they do that? It is a plane. We're going to do that. We can barely count the ones that are there now. What are we going to do to get 90,000 salmon? And the environmental say, oh, yeah, well, we know that. But we, we can't concede the point. We'll lose our negotiating leverage. Right. Uh, Jay has written these delicious stories about negotiations uh, called uh, Playing Chicken in the Delta, which if you have not read it, I recommend it for your opinion. Now, another thing that's really interesting, the governor and the secretary said in their press conference, science will guide water exports and environmental restoration in the Bay Delta Conservation. Direct quote, science will go. Ooh, that's really interesting. Not that they said science is going to be involved, because that's a, you know, that's a toss away line. Science is going to be involved, all the interests are going to be involved, <coughs> the exporters are going to be involved, the environmental are going to be involved, all politicians will be involved, all governmental agencies will be involved, everyone with a PhD in ecosystem analysis will be, you know, that's just, that's the, <coughs> the endless massaging you know, that goes through the American policy. But it, what it really implies, for the first time, is that scientific decisions on the level of water exports will be involved. Now, I can see that in this crazy quilt pattern of governmental authority and control and all that, they've been involved. But this elevated it to a new level. By the way, uh, we counted up in Dell Division, and we counted up in Delta Stewardship Council, the number of public agencies with some legal authority in the Delta or around the Delta. We stopped counting at 200 federal, state, and local agencies. It's Americans. Americans are demanding efficiency. They want small government. They want, in, they want but they don't want arbitrary government. They don't want powerful government. They want everyone to work together, which is kind of like why your professors say all of you Work out your own grades. There are three A's, three B's, the rest of you get C's. So give me a unanimous opinion coming back next week. And you are able to do it, right? Because you're smart and talented, sincere and dedicated. Um, there's a, out of the 17,000 pages in the Environmental Impact Report and the 5,000 in the, in the uh, BDCP plan, there's actually 32 pages that would be worth your effort taking a look at. It's called Chapter 7. And it deals, I can't remember, I think the title is Implementation or something. But it's really about governance and science. And it's the closest thing uh, I've seen to almost fronting a plan that you can understand. Uh, I don't want to overstate the issue. But it is not without significance that not a single environmental group, not a single group of scientists, not even the, the folks here at the watershed science people who do reports like every 35 minutes and logs twice a week. Not that, not one of them has presented an alternative governance or science structure position paper to either the Bay Delta Conservation Plan or to us or to the Now, that's for a lot of reasons. This is an actual pretty serious effort. I mean, I think it's got problems in it. You know, it raises the right question. My, my instinct is that the best you can expect of big, messy things is it raises the right questions, and then you hope a lot of the answers get right. So is it independent science, or are they going to depend on science presented by the advocates, you know, this feared thing of uh, combat science that all these colorful scientific writers uh, talk about uh, all this time? And, and nobody knows, but it's important. What are, are there some other issues? Yes. Here, here my flag is just less than I won't talk about. Is the Bay Delta Conservation Plan required to comply?
apply and co-eat the rules of state law, which, by the way, have also been put in federal law, too. We asked that question of BDCP two years ago, and I think nobody knows the answer. I think they privately would say, well, we sure hope not, because that might confuse things a lot. But, you know, everybody's hiding the, everybody's saying the co equal rules of the policy of the state of California and the federal government. Everything will be, well, okay. But it's a practical question, are they required to? Number two, will BDCP include projections of decreased reliance on the Delta for future water needs? by California law. And of course, the question we talked about, what, what are they doing right now on this question of legal guarantees? By the way, legal guarantees, I, I believe that everybody's like, no, we're not asking for legal guarantees. But I think people are going to shift to, but we would like reasonable assurances. Now that, okay, guarantees, no, reasonable assurances, no, I don't, I, they're too far down the court to easily do that. Uh, how will the pending new water quality standards for the Delta hopefully to be adopted by the Water Resources Control Board play in DDCP? Big, hot, practical, tough, mean question. And then apart from all of that, who pays for what? I'm not going to talk about who pays for what, except to point out the water contract is the They will pay full cost on construction, operation, and maintenance of the new facility. Full cost, and they will pay for legally required mitigation. Now, on the other side, is hmm, I wonder if we can get, if we expand that definition of what mitigation means to pick up other things. But that's, that's a pretty important thing to remember. Now, in spite of all the questions I've got about ADCP, I just, I'm, I call myself a grumpy old water guy. Uh, but I've been doing water for a long time, 25 years as an elected. Uh, and I'm still grumpy, but I'm a little more optimistic than I thought I was going to be. There are signs. I, I'm, I'm great for reading tea leaves, so, and I wasn't the boss of the assembly, but Willie Brown, my former boss and friend, was. And because I worked for him for years before his staff, people would all come to me and say, what's he thinking? And I'd say, well, what do you mean? Go ask him. And he said, well, he won't say anything. He talks to me about movies. Which, by the way, that is what secret meetings between governors and the legislative leadership on budgets. Uh, I know you don't believe me. This is true. They always start off, what movie did you see last week? Oh, God, we've got a great movie. Willie was always into shoot em up movies. Whether he'd seen them or whether he pretended he was going to see them. So part of my role as a young legislator was, uh, as Willie told me, what he said, Phil, listen for the audience. Right, well, I'll we'll call a play at the scrimmage line and we'll just go. And you know, so I sat around for months and months and months and months waiting for audibles. Well, guess what? Willie's skill is an understanding, was an understanding that not taking position while appearing to maybe favor any position that people who are talking to you is the most important thing for a legislative leader to do. Once you're committed, you're going to fight with somebody about something until you're. So, Tea leaves is what I read. And I want to tell you about a couple of things that people said, I don't want to talk about that stupid. Uh, two years ago, the Planning and Conservation League, which is to the death, to the death, opposed to a peripheral canal, a tunnel, or anything else, proposed the debate on the conservation plan study a 3,000 cubic foot per second tunnel. Now, they made it very clear. I repeat today because Jonas Benton from PCL will be yelling at me within 30 minutes of me saying this. They made very clear an, a, an offer to study something does not imply, does not suggest, does not even hint at the notion we might find it acceptable because God knows we have high standards. Every once in a while, somebody pops up with something which, if you read the tea leaves, is an offer to talk. It's not a promise to support. It's an offer to talk. The political owner is trying to find your way through the adjectives, invectives, and high volumes and pick up the elements. Uh, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the, the big octopus as we used to call them in the old days, joined with six Northern California water agencies in January of last year 
and he sent a letter to the state of California. And they said, guys, all of us agree that the state of California should spend $163 million in various designated levy improvements. Now, I know what you're going to say. It's always easy to spend somebody else's money. That's, in fact, the easiest. It's, it's like asking the student body at UC Davis to allocate money for the campus. Or worse, <coughs> uh, but you know, it's the first time Beth said while BDCP was going on that there might be some Delta levies where statewide interests would be served by their strengthening, not just simply the interest of the property owners for them. Uh, that was poo poo. Oh, Christ's sake, spending all the money. Well, and I, I was a poo poo on one level because it's nuts to think the state of California is going to pay for all the ideas the locals, the water contractors, and the environmentalists think up. Oh, ain't going to work. But there's a sign. It is a significant sign, and it started a small discussion on Delta levies that is focused on things that might also benefit statewide interest. Number two. Within three months, the local Delta interest and some other and some environmental groups had read about this and they said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's have a, let's have a consultant discussion on our own, a free-ranging discussion about other options, other, other projects. Well, they came up with a list of 43 projects. They didn't put them in any priority order. They aren't ranking them. Um, and they were very careful to say that anybody who walked in the door with an idea that, you know, even that didn't cause everybody to laugh out loud would be on the list. And they they recommended spending almost a billion dollars showing that you can actually improve on spending somebody else's money to just give it a little effort. But there too, the same things being discussed. Delta interest have been inherently suspicious of any discussion of anything except payment for Delta levy because they think it implies political commitment for BDCP, for restoration of land for habitat purposes, which they oppose. That's an important thing. Uh, number three, there was a, um, a state and federal water contract, the big guys, uh, came into the Dallas Tourism Council in uh, December of last year. And the Westlands Water District, which all of you know is a big gorilla in the water in the Central Valley, the Westlands Water District owns 1,485 acres in the old life now it's in Vikings, so there's not a motel, there's not a hotel, there's not uh, you know an Esalon retreat. It's just kind of open land that's flooded, but it's not as productive for ecosystem values as it could be. I think that's the shorthand way to say. It. And they say, hey, we'd like to spend some money, our money, on doing that. Now you say, okay, well that's great. They're spending their own money. Fine. We're, we're opposed to their canal, but we can. They said something else. They said, this is to satisfy the existing biological opinions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the ones that are the law today. And for the first time, a project of ecosystem got moved at distance from the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Because you understand, when there's a big political deal going on, it sucks up all the air in the room, it sucks up all the energy, everybody delays every rational thing you can do in the short term until the big deal is done. That's really significant. About uh, a couple weeks later, the Nature Conservancy, which uh, owns the Hawking Williamson track in North Delta, came in and said, hey, we're ready to go too. If you look around at the projects of a modest size, you can see a number of them. I think the uh, South Yolo project, Army Williamson, uh, probably my favorite, the uh, proposed uh, South, uh, uh, South San Joaquin floodplain between Lake Road and Tracy, for a whole host of reasons that we don't do it soon, but the buildings will just get closer and closer and sort of wind up with flood emergency relief of billions of dollars. And even the formation of the Delta Wide Flood Assessment District, controlled by local agencies. Those are the kinds of things that start to feel like a deal. And the nomenclature now is near term. So if you're looking for some fast action, by the way, you can't add things to much to the list because then the money gets gigantic. So this is not a history story in particular. Um, here's the Eisenberg uh, plan. I've said, I've said something to say before. 
if you want to do a uh, if you want to do near-term actions, here's how you do it. One, they simultaneously have to serve the co-equal goals, water reliability and ecosystem improvement in the Delta. And because you have to recognize the uniqueness of the Delta for folks who live there, floodplains that provide ecosystem benefits might be a nice connection to also help with the unique aspects of the Delta. Number two, I'll tell you what you need to do. We have stiffed maintenance and repair of the existing water project in and around the Delta and the entire state of Delta for a decade. I mean, it's off. Now, recessions, that's what people do. You know, you don't fire anybody. You, 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 you stop doing maintenance and repair. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's still going on today. I think two of them have been repaired. Horrible, the big dam on the start of the state water. That's a, a streamlined version of governance and science comparable to what the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is doing. The advantage of, of, of doing that is you might be able to test some really wild notions. For example, scientists, independent scientists, might be actually voting on operational decisions and be subject to the death penalty and screw it up. Um, maybe there's a way to do near-term actions and test some of the theories and learn from those tests so that the larger projects and our systems can respond. And then uh, the thing that makes the most sense to me, fast track. No, uh, I don't. Okay, why are we going to Well, that just means abolishing C. No, it doesn't mean abolishing C. But, but if these are agreed upon projects for God's sakes, they're emergency, they don't like, I mean, just do the things. Uh, then last, put a fence around it, a modest dollar. The fence I put around it is near term actions, $1 billion to be spent and completed over 10 years. Now, you say, well, that's a lot of money. It is. It's as much as the, the petty cash account of the watershed science program. <laughs> and look, every year in California, every year, even during the recession, for water and wastewater in the state, all governmental agencies, from federal, state, local, we spend $20 million a year for operations. We spend 5 to $6 billion a year for capital improvements. A billion dollars in that context is pretty modest, and if it comes from contractors and water districts who benefit and property owners and some from the state, it's doable. Uh, now, last thing, Governor Jerry Brown has many things, and here's what he said, and Jay's prepared a translation. He said it seven months ago. Okay, who's a Latin scholar and can translate? Come on, J1. <laughs> There's one word I couldn't translate. Well, it's, I want to get at the, 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 the famous <laughs> press conference in July of 2012. Uh, Governor standing there and Secretary Salazar standing there, and Jerry Brown says, "I want to do shit." That's exactly what he said. And the press corps went, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ta, 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 ta. <laughs> so I figure I'd symbolize that. And I figured, this is the vote of the staff, scientists, and Google on a translation of that term. God knows if it's correct. <laughs> Jerry Brown is closer to the National Research Council of the Academies of Science on these issues than you might imagine. I mean, I know he's a, he's a progressive Democrat. He's got more money for education. For, for slamming hard on global warming, he's for, uh, uh, for a lot of productive environmental change. And he is tight with money. He is seriously tight with money. He is not pretending to be tight with money. This is a guy who means it when he says we have to learn to live within our means. Now, we don't like that. California is supposed to be opportunity without limits. Oh, give me a break. Uh, but it's hard work. My friend Eric Nibble, who was one of our hotshot engineers at the Public Stewardship Council, and, and this lone, rational voice uh, in Davis for fiscal prudence, me, I get to be a, you know, a, 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 an environmental Democrat to say the same thing. Ironically, Governor Brown talks about budget, state government, our opportunities to do good 
In the same language, the National Academy of Science taught about water in Delta in California last year. And I want to read you what the, these are the these are real hot shots. These are real, these are big guys in the science field. They did a report called Sustainable Water and Environmental Management in the Bay Delta. Here, here are just six quotes. The future will require planning and management that specifically acknowledge and take into account there's not enough water to meet all desired uses in California with the required degree of reliability everywhere and at all times. Well, that's a big matter, right? The fact, next quote, the fact of water scarcity does not mean the state is running out of water. Although most surface flows have been fully allocated or over allocated, the state can use a number of tools that optimize the use of existing supplies. Number three, if you, it kind of support, it, that, it gave us some kind of support too, but we were working with this. Number three, the historic strategy of developing storage and conveyance facilities in response to growth in water demand is being replaced with a variety of supply and demand management alternatives, including conservation. That is declared not as a recommendation, but as what's going on, everything I know convinces me of that. Here's where it gets dicey for the environmentalists. The delta as it was before large-scale alteration by humans, before about 1880, cannot be recovered. That's pretty dramatic. When speaking of the delta, consideration of the large number of stressors, that's what we now call all the pesky things that do bad stuff in the delta, and their effects and interaction, leads to the conclusion that efforts to eliminate any one stressor are unlikely to reverse declines in the listed species. Now, again, we got a whole bunch of people who think if you could kill all the striped bass, the salmon would be great, and they hate this kind of stuff. And last, given the diverse set of organisms and processes that constitute the Delta ecosystem, the ultimate success of any approach targeted to particular species seems doubtful. Now, you know how controversial that is in the environmental world. What do you mean? Jesus Christ! Dangerous species, it's a law! You know, Governor Brown would say things like that, not in his own way, not the way the scientists did. Uh, he'd parse each comment, he'd throw in four Latin phrases, he'd give you uh, uh, some of, uh, some of uh, Thomas Mann, uh, just to kind of show that he's, he's paying attention to humanism. But, you know, they're actually, in their own ways, in my opinion, saying kind of the same thing. Be prudent, make choices, do things. I think it's pretty good. So, here we are. That's it. <laughs>
cause the hackles of the environmental agencies to go up because they say, wait a minute, this is where we have the shot and a good chance of protecting fish, and you're going to suck a lot of water out there. You're going to kind of like make it like Clifton Port Corbay at high pump periods now. Uh, and the other thing, you know, it's an idea. There, there, there are ideas all around. Bob has been in with uh, several versions of the idea uh, on and off for the past two years. I, I think it, I, I think it, I think there are elements that come through. If I were to pick, if we were today to pick a water supply system configuration, fetch a thousand dollars, we wouldn't have it located in the Delta. I mean, I can't imagine that knowing what we know now, we consciously do that. And moving to the West, for an intake, although it solves the problem of some of the surrounding counties and communities in the Bay Area, hardly sounds like a real, really a reliable water supply in California to me. I could be wrong. I'm prepared to listen. So I, I'm interested, but I don't think there's anything magical. And I would wager there are serious environmental questions about an intake wherever it's located, including right under the Cartines Bridge, if they want to go that far. Did you ever hear about the Reaver Gate? <laughs> there are ideas in, in the water world that survived. The Reaver Gate was, let's build a Dutch-style barrier at the Cartinas Bridge so we could just simply close the barrier to you know, protect people from flooding. Kind of like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the big uh, uh, flood surge barrier in Watergate is designed, which has been used once, not for flood purposes, but for test purposes. I mean, it's the biggest damn thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it just, it's, it's, it's Star Wars stuff. It's terrific. It's terrific. Um, but the other one that, that uh, my favorite blogger, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Austin, found is the, is the Big Squirt. Did you see the Big Squirt? An engineer in Southern California in the 1950s actually threw up plans to build gigantic cameras in the inside of this room and space them a mile apart from the Colorado River up to Los Angeles. And they would, by pressure, squirt water out at intervals that would go one mile away to the next one. And the report was highlighted by the, I think it was a, a mean spirited newspaper man who reported on the story and interrupted it by saying, uh, Newsflash just came in. A commercial jetliner was flying over the Los Angeles region today, and we reported the fall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to land in Los Angeles. Oh! Or of the turn on the windshield wipers. <laughs> anyway, there are endearing ideas. That are, and you know, the problem is, if they've been around a long time, you have the impression they can't be right. You've got you to be open to ideas. Yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering what is your opinion on keeping the price of water low now so we have a chance to, um, a chance to grow as a state? Uh, keep the price of water low. To keep the price of water low now so we have a chance to grow. Um, and the reason I ask is partially due to the natural disasters of sand. Uh, well, you know, we don't charge for water in California. We charge for loss of conveying water from somewhere to some place and feeding food. But you know, it's rare that there's a direct surcharge that constitutes a major part of any water bill. Free market advocates and environmentalists have argued for years that we in fact should be charging the full price for water. Tom Graff, the famous now deceased the lead lawyer for the Environmental Defense Fund, spent a career in the 1980s jointly promoting the recent foundation of the American Enterprise Institution, the notion that we should be, if people had to pay a re the actual price of water, that use would drop down. And it's probably fair to say that the price signals, as economists say, have a lot to do with the level of usage. Uh, you know, the thing, the thing that's really interesting, we ought to take a look at some of the publications that Jay and Ellen have come out with, including the, uh, the books where they have shown the pattern of water use. You understand patterns of use are kind of dropping, crime uh, rate drops, and it takes us 30 years to, to, to understand that. Uh, and they've also done it, I, I 
think this is correct, in one of your last bulletins, one of Alan, Alan's papers, they, they associated water use with value of water and GDP. And, you know, we, we, we have a system now where we, our $2 billion economy, uh, roughly 80% of all the water used for human purposes, not the environment, human purposes, used by agriculture, which is hovering under 2% of the GDP. Now, it's important for a host of reasons, but it's, you know, we, this is another area where we simply refuse as a society to choose between market principles and subsidies. And I don't see that changing. The argument that we should lower prices in water, which usually translates to the state of California should issue far more bonds so we don't have to charge more people with water so the economy can grow, I think is undercut by the fact that the growth in the California economy is not in water intense areas. It's another thing. Fracking might be the one area natural gas extraction, where water usage offers the potential to grow. But, you know, other than that, I, I don't know what new ones are. Agriculture is, and in almost all societies on Earth, still the biggest single consuming use of water, because people can food. And, and political choices follow. Is there one more question? For a little bit. Turn that on to people. Right. No, it's okay. It's, it's for recording. Jay, Jay tries to keep people from being heard. And <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned sea level rise, and in fact, that we might be having five feet rise on 2100. 2100. And I don't know what's going on. How do you feel that sea level rise can be appropriate to where do you need to take? For the Delta plan, as with Delta Vision, we assume that that estimate range, which was given to us by our Delta scientists, including Mr. Lund, after a couple of years of study, was our working assumption on sea level rise. So even in Delta Vision, we put that into account. The Delta plan, the stewardship council does the same thing. Interestingly, the 2009 legislation, this big bill package, including bonds, required the Bay Delta Conservation Plan to study the impact of sea level rise up to that same level. Uh, I, I thought I had talked to Arnold Schwarzenegger at one time, but remembers this, in issuing an executive order that all state agencies should use that for planning purposes, but it got derailed. Uh, I still think that's the right way to go. It is, by the way, now seen by the scientific community, as best I understand it, as a relatively conservative range estimate, because the other studies have been increasing the level. But again, it's a slow, changing threat. What were you? Uh, but if you design the interests, et cetera, and then for whatever reason, you don't work at the end of the level rise. Well, the, 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 the impact of sea level rise on the upper parts of the delta, I think, from everything I've heard, is relatively modest. In the San Francisco Bay, for sure. I mean, you watch the folks at Oakland and San Francisco Airport go nuts, building up walls over the next 30, 40 years. Uh, but the farther you get from the ocean, the less of the impact. I don't want to say it isn't possible. And the fear always is catastrophic failure by earthquake at various level, uh, levels, simultaneously with rapid sea level rise over a long period of time, together with stupid decisions not to protect the human habitats and rampant urban development. And you, you can imagine a real disaster, but I, I think painfully slow as it is, we're inching toward planning level assumptions for governmental agencies, federal, state, and local, they're going to be very close to that. And pretty soon. Thank you. It's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you very much.